Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today we're pleased to present Get Buy-In to Drive Change. I'm Jeanette DePatty from the Lean Startup Conference happening November 16th through 19th in San Francisco. Visit leanstartup.co for more information. Our speakers today are Cindy Alvarez and Mark Graben. Cindy Alvarez is the author of Lean Customer Development, Building Products Your Customers Will Buy, and Director of User Experience for Yammer, a Microsoft company. She has over a dozen years' experience leading design, product management, user research, and customer development for startups, and is currently using that background to drive intrapreneurial change within Microsoft. Mark Rabin is VP of Customer Success for software company KyNexus and founder of LeanBlog.org. Since 2005, Mark has worked exclusively in healthcare and has become an expert in the field. Mark is author of the book, Lean Hospitals, Improving Quality, Patient Safety, and Employee Engagement. Now let me give you a few housekeeping notes. We'll take questions from the audience via the live chat. If you'd like to ask a question, please flag it with the letter Q followed by a colon. The speakers will answer questions towards the second half of the webcast, so there's no need to answer to ask your questions twice. This is a one-hour program, and the recording will be available a few days after this live webcast. Take it away, Mark. All right, well, thanks, Jeanette, and thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us today. Cindy, thank you for being here, so we'll jump right in. You've got um, a really interesting background um, for the technology world. You studied psychology in college. You, you've said you, know, you didn't originally set out to work in technology, so can you tell us a little bit you know, more about your background and how you got to where you are today? Sure thing. So you know, I've always been interested in how people think and how they work, even before I knew psychology was a discipline. I had every intention of going to college and studying psychology and becoming a professor. Sounded like a great, uh, easygoing life. Um, when I got there, I bought a computer. It was the first computer I'd owned, and it was the most expensive thing I'd ever owned. And I realized it was really stupid to have this amazing thing and not understand how it worked. And so I kind of threw myself into learning how the computer worked. I ended up um, teaching myself how to maintain it, installing hardware, doing some basic sysadmining, teaching myself to program, kind of everything. And I found that as I did that, uh, one of the things is, at somewhere along the line, I got a job working at a software help desk on campus. And I realized that computers were extremely baffling and unnerving, even to you know, Nobel Prize winners. You know, I, was at, I was at Harvard, there were these immensely intelligent people who would come to me with a floppy disk and have no idea what, how to figure it out. And I was like, there's, there's something here about this amazing technology and how people interact with it and how someone who can be you know, a snooty professor in class can then come in like, you know, almost in tears. And, and so I was like, somehow I have to combine these. Um, now people always say my background makes perfect sense. At the time, it was actually something that people would look at me oddly, like psychology and computers, that's the weirdest thing we've ever heard. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned floppy disks. We've got people watching today that probably never used an actually floppy yes. floppy yeah. disk. But I know, I know <laughs> what you mean. They can they can look that up. But um, yeah, it's interesting. It seems like you know, your career kind of uh, parallels some of the changes in the startup space, where it's not just about the code, but making sure we understand people, their 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 problems, the business need that they have, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, now you've been focused on customer development for a long time. You, you've worked with organizations of all different sizes. Um, what, what are some of the mistakes that you've, that you've made along the way? Um, you know, one of them is, is trying to be prescriptive, and it's a mistake that I think everyone makes, which is, in general, you want people to use something, you want it to work for them, and a lot of times you can see very clearly how your customer should be doing things. You can see, like, they, you know, they should be setting things up in this way, they should be using the software in this way, and it's just not quite working. And so you want to tell them, here, here, this is what you do instead, but you have to listen. So I think that's very common, is for people to ask inadvertently leading questions. That's one thing. Another is, you know, when I talk about customer development, people's first thought is, is getting new customers to use products. But a lot of the times, how I'm using that technique is actually to drive change, which might be process change, it might be attitudes, 
And when you're doing that, again, there's that sense of you want people to do the right thing, and so you kind of want to push a little bit harder, and that's not something that, that works real well. And uh, Yammer, for example, immediately post-acquisition, I think we entered Microsoft and we were so full of ideas of this is how things should work. Mm -hmm. This is how things should be. Like, listen to us. And I think we actually went a little too far in that. And there were a lot of people who, who didn't really want to listen. They kind of put up their hands like, you know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand our context. So we're just going to ignore things you said. And I feel like, you know, after a few months we learned, but, you know, we probably wasted some opportunity in trying to be like, no, we're right, listen to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like a, a familiar situation. Uh, coming in with solutions, being excited about them, uh, startups. Mm -hmm. run into that same problem, or even product teams, I'm sure, within a big company, they're excited and pushing that technology instead of trying to create pull, right? Right. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's interesting because the reasons why people do or do not make changes or adopt things seem really small. They seem really stupid. And, and they're not. Uh, people don't like change, and, and, you know, anything that's friction is much, much higher than we think. So we'll see people do things and think, well, that's ridiculous. They should just do this. They should just have this workaround. They should just put up with it. But that's not what people do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got the psychology background. People are not always perfectly rational in terms of, of doing course. what we should do, right? You know, economists uh, refer to this as, behavioral economists refer to this as SIFs, supposedly irrelevant factors. <laughs> and they drive a huge amount of the changes that people make. Yeah. Or don't. Yeah. Um, I want to follow up, you, know, you talk about inadvertently leading questions. Could you share a story or an example or two of what might be an inadvertently leading question? Sure. Um, you know, wouldn't you like, don't you think, are I think are two classic openings. And a lot of times you might see that someone has a problem. And so you just want them to kind of go ahead and admit it so that you can, you can chalk it down as like, yes, our hypothesis is validated. Mm -hmm. So... Someone might say, oh, you know, our marketing automation software works just fine. And you know that it doesn't because no one's does. And so you say, but don't you think it would be easier if? And the thing is, once someone has led with that, it's very, very easy for you to just say, well, yeah. And it doesn't necessarily reflect how you feel. I mean, people can push back, but... You know, I was tweeting the other day about political polls, and I think a lot of them are, are conducted with that, you know, don't you agree that, you know... Well, yeah. I mean, unless you really, really, really don't agree, you're going to say, yeah, I guess so. And then you're going to get misleading information. So, you know, I can disregard polls, but if I ask a misleading question and I get customers to say something that makes me believe they're going to buy my product, but they're not, I mean, that's what sinks a lot of startups right there. Yeah. Yeah. And some of those leading questions, I think, are intentional. They call that push polling, where yes. they're really kind of hiding behind... Um, yeah. asking questions. And it's not always malicious. I found a lot of times product managers, when they want to go out, or startup founders, when they want to go out and do research, they really want this thing to be true because they think it's a great solution. It might actually be a great solution, but they will in a, do that inadvertent leading. Uh, some, one of my colleagues uh, within Microsoft shared a story of he was having user researchers and product managers both doing some research on a new layout for... I think maybe Dynamics, and the user researchers were just opening up the screen and asking people, how would you go about completing this task? The product managers were saying, click here to start this task, now how would you complete it? Mm. And they got completely different results. You know, the user researchers were like, we have some serious work to do on revamping the UX, and the product managers were like, it's great, everyone did the task perfectly. But the problem was that the starting point was completely not discoverable. But it was if they hadn't had both sets, they wouldn't have realized that, and they would have, you know, inadvertently missed out on a really big opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, you know larger organizations or, or being you know acquired, uh, you know Yammer being part of Microsoft now. If um, enterprise organizations are often like a collection of dozens of small companies, you know how how do you suggest people navigate? through different cultures, uh, you know, so that the overall organization can grow and succeed? Sure. So the first thing, and whether you're working in a company like Microsoft or a startup, is to understand what is the culture? And I don't mean, you know, ping pong and free drinks, but what, how are people behaving today? What are they afraid of? As in, like, if this happened, it would be the worst thing ever. What do their bosses reward them for? What 
have how has been the reaction to change in the past? Have they seen someone try something new and get punished for it? So if you understand the behaviors people have and the very real constraints they have and the risks that they feel like they're up against, then you can start providing them with a solution. You know, for example, if someone if there's an organization that you know, every time someone tried something new and it didn't work, that person got punished, you're going to have people who don't want to try something. If the most important thing in an organization is meeting deadlines, people are not going to take an action which, you know, hinders the predictability of what they're going to do. And customer development is, you know, one of the most unpredictable things you can do. You set out not knowing what you're going to learn. You set out not knowing how this might throw you off. And I've had earnest people say, well, if we do that research, we might discover that this the stuff on our roadmap is wrong. And, you know, they don't think about how ridiculous that is. Like, oh, my gosh, the last thing we'd want to do is discover that we're about to invest a year in doing something wrong. But, you know, in the short term, they're thinking, my boss wanted me to meet a deadline. Yeah. And if I don't meet that deadline, something bad's going to happen. People think very locally instead of globally. It's just how we behave as humans. Mm-hmm. No, and, and you mentioned, I mean, you asked a great question, what do people fear? I've worked in big companies where there often is a lot of fear. You know, the mm-hmm. boss tells you to do something, you have to go be successful. And it's not that openness about learning that something is a bad idea. Um, you know, I think that fear probably leads to people asking leading questions or wanting to mm-hmm. confirm and give the right answer. Um, I'm curious, you know, again, maybe delving the psychology do you have examples or stories around how that fear leads to different problems or dysfunctions or anything you can do about that fear? So one of the things is that typically fear is, is irrational. I mean, in all cases, but especially in the workplace. So someone says, we can't do that because bad things will happen. And I think it's very useful to actually think about, well, what bad things will happen? What's the worst case scenario? And I think you know, generally people shy away from that. Like if you want people to change, the last thing you want to do is get them thinking about what might happen. But I find it's actually very freeing. So if someone says, what if we do this, what will happen? You know, and you, you literally ask, well, what could happen? And they might say, well, we could get sued. Well, on what grounds could we get sued? OK, well, we don't, we don't actually want to break any laws, so, so let's not do that. But it might be, our customers might get mad. And you say, well, what would we do if our customers got mad? What would be the potential fallout of that? And a lot of times, the fallout is, customers would get mad. And that's not actually a consequence. Uh, you know, people get mad and you apologize and you move on, typically. Now, if someone says, there's a very, very real possibility that if we do this, this customer will cancel this contract, will lose millions of dollars. If that's a real possibility, then that's not a risk profile we should take on. And I think, you know, startups a lot of times can kind of go for broke and be like, ah, oh, we'll do this, what heck, you know, what the heck. Enterprises can't. But that doesn't mean they can't try other things. And a lot of times when you get people to actually think about it, uh, you know, people in software often talk about doing post-mortems after a project. I like to promote doing pre-mortems. What's the worst thing that could happen? What's an acceptable level of risk that we're willing to take? And if you get people to actually think it through, they might say, well, it's okay if we do this. Like, maybe we'll get some customers angry, but worst case scenario might be, I have to get on the phone and personally apologize to 20 people. That's mm-hmm. not fun, but it's not that hard either. You can do it in a day. Yeah, I, and I love that phrase, uh, you know, pre-mortem. You know, my background is industrial engineering, and you know, we're taught something called uh, failure mode effects analysis, FMEA, mm-hmm. which is really kind of that proactive discussion around at not, not just asking what could go wrong, what, you know, what's the likelihood it could occur, what's the severity, mm-hmm. and how hard would it be to detect that that problem occurs, and yeah. that can give you a framework for a little bit more rationally going through that, but I, I think you know there's a human nature of people sometimes just not wanting you know don't be negative or, or there's yeah. other you know psychology that gets in the way of um, of doing that perhaps. Yeah. Um, so you know I think if if fear uh, is is human nature you know kind of moving on to a different topic I think it's also sort of human nature for people to like to jump to solutions and. You know, organizations often uh, reward that. You know, we see this back in, in my roots in lean manufacturing, you know, uh, jumping the solutions. We see this uh, as a problem in healthcare organizations. And so, you know, we struggle with trying to get people to first define a problem. Can, can you mm-hmm. give us an example or a story in your work of, of trying to get people to focus on the problem instead of jumping to a solution? Sure. Um, I think one of the things in the early days of Yammer is that 
when I came on board and I started talking to customers, all of our account managers were saying, you know, all of our customers want more administrative controls on Yammer. And they'd heard this, you know, literally from everyone, they're convinced, like, we're going to have to build in more toggles, which is something, you know, we as a software org have been very opposed to. And I said, well, let's, let's talk to people about what they really need. And I was kind of given this, like, sure, sure, you can talk to people, but look, we know they all want administrative controls. When I talked to actual humans and basically said, okay, just to understand, you, you're saying that you wanted more administrative controls. I want to make sure I understand exactly what that will do for you. you know, how would your life be better if we had them? If we'd already had them, what would you be able to do that you can't today? And when I asked this of, say, 20 different people, I got literally 20 different answers. And so there was this shorthand. They were all using the same shorthand language. But some people were asking for features that already existed. Some people were asking for moderation features to the extent where, honestly, they shouldn't be using Yammer. Uh, you know, you can't have an open network and, and want to control everything that people say. Some people wanted uh, data export features that already existed. Some people wanted keyword searching that already existed. Um, some people were just plain afraid that someone would get on there and say something really, really offensive. And there's honestly nothing we can build to prevent that. Of course, you know, you're signing on with your name, so most likely. And to my knowledge, in the six plus years that Yammer has existed, no one has ever gotten on and said something so egregiously awful that they, you know, they needed discipline. It's just people don't do that. But the thing was, there was a solution that everyone jumped to, both customers and our internal people. And the problems were incredibly varied. And we see this happen all the time. People say, you need to build this. And it can sound very combative if you don't do it correctly, but the answer is always to say, okay, why are you asking for this? If you had this, what would it allow you to do? And sometimes the answer is, well, it would just be nice to have. And, you know, as a software development company, that means don't build it. When someone just says something would be nice to have and they literally can't think of a use for it, that's not the, where the highest opportunity cost is. But a lot of times they're saying, I want this because I can't do this, and there might be a much better solution. Yeah, so the, the I can't do this is at least closer to a problem statement than I want that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think people, they think they're saving us time by asking for a feature. <laughs> saying, just build this feature and it'll be okay. Look, I'll, I'll even spec it out for you. I mean, I've had people <laughs> offer to spec things out for me. But that doesn't actually help us. What helps us is knowing what, what are you trying to do that you can't do today. And sometimes knowing that problem will reveal that they're trying to do something so obscure that it doesn't make sense to build it for that 1%. Or they're having a problem that many, many other people are having and they just can't articulate, so awesome, let's solve that problem as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, jump to uh, a question from the audience. Those questions mm -hmm. are, are coming in, so thank you for that. Um, Cindy, you know, it says, uh, discovering company culture often seems to require a lot of time, a lot of trial and error. Do you have suggestions for speeding up that process or better learning, better understanding an organization's culture? Sure. So I think one of the most telling questions is to ask people about something that went well and something that went badly, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily for them personally, but say, you know, tell me, walk me through the last project that your team worked on. You know, how did, how did that go from beginning to end? Who came up with the idea? Who approved it? Who was working on it? And then as you're going, ask more, you know, when, what, where, who, why questions. Oh, that's interesting. Well, why did you do that? Oh, so you had status of meetings. Um, did everyone attend those? Oh, they didn't. Okay, well, well, what happened next? Or, you know, how did you decide to cut that short? And you kind of get, it, you pull from that, well, we did this because we wanted to avoid risk. If there's a lot of things that people are doing to reduce risk, that tells you something about the culture. If there are a lot of people who are involved, but they aren't actually doing any work, they're just kind of there because they need to be in the know, that tells you a lot about culture. One question that's been really useful is saying, you know, tell us about, um, tell us about when someone tried to introduce a change and it didn't go well. And a lot of times if you ask about someone else, that's more helpful than saying, you know, Mark, tell me about the last time you tried to introduce change and it didn't go well for you. That's an embarrassing question. But you can almost certainly answer it about an anonymous coworker. You can say, oh, well, you know, my coworker Dave tried this and, you know, it just went terribly. And then you can say, well, why do you think that was? Why, how do you think he could have done it better? And you probably have a good insight. Dave should have gotten buy-in. Dave should have explained the risks. Dave should have known that we don't care about X thing. 
So asking those kind of questions, you can get a very real sense for where are those risks and, and what are the mistakes that have been made in the past. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will bring up a, a mistake from years and years ago. You know, well, 10 years ago, Dave did this. And you're like, wow, you know, if the corporate memory is hanging on to that, that's, that's tough. Those are tough environments to change. Yeah. So um, kind of uh, taking things back to uh, this, uh, you know, approaches for defining problems, being problem focused. Uh, how do you incorporate that thinking, you know, kind of, you know, more specifically into customer discovery and development efforts? So with identifying problem, it's just a lot of repeating, uh, just constantly trying to train, train into people. Whenever you hear "I want this," you should step back and say, just to understand, why is it that you want that? Whenever you find yourself saying, "We should do this," take a step back and say, "Why am I suggesting this?" and you know, it's just something where you need a cultural reinforcement. You need a lot of people who are comfortable kind of reminding everyone to do that. And I think, um, you know, former consultants seem to be extremely good at this for some reason, but, uh, but just anyone who, who doesn't mind kind of being that person in the meeting who says, <clears throat> you need a bunch of those. <laughs> and so, like, within our Yammer network, a lot of times someone will say something and someone else will be like, what's the problem statement? Or we'll find ourselves, you know, rewriting a message to say we should do this and then like here's a step back here's what I think the problem is and it's like we can't we can't resist suggesting solutions but it's like let's just make very sure that we understand the problem and there should always be someone in the room who feels empowered to say wait what, what's the problem we're trying to solve here and I think you need a lot of people to kind of be willing you need that cultural willingness for everyone to agree with that person so if you say hey what's the problem here someone else in the room should say oh Mark is right we should think about what the problem is. And if you don't have that backup, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a high-level person. If you have several mid-career people who are willing to back each other up, that's right, we sh we, let's focus on the problem. That can be enough. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's hard to build new habits in terms yeah, of absolutely. not jumping the solution or building that habit of asking that question about problems, right? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like having that backup helps reinforce, help build. Mm -hmm. uh, and any other thoughts in general about you know building new habits or, or things that are helpful for organizations or even individuals? Um. Sure. Well, you know, if you read Chip and Dan Heath, Made to Stick, and, and some other great books, they talk about the things that drive people to change. And it's there's there's a couple of things that drive people to change. One is the epiphany, like your doctor says you have two weeks to live unless you stop eating crap and start exercising that a very small percentage of the time will drive people to change. Very, very small. Like, it really has to be rock bottom. Most of the time, it's environmental change. You are not going to uh, go to the gym if the gym is too far from your house. So pick a gym that's close to your house. You're more likely to go. Um, so changing your environment so that things are easier. If you, if you don't want to eat snacks, don't buy snacks. Yeah. So for any of those things, just building it so that you have reminders. And physical reminders can be very important. Just like a sign that says, remember the problem. You know, or, or the room I'm in right now is our user research room. There's stickies all over the place. And that's a physical reminder for us of things that customers have said, of behaviors that customers have had. And so when we kind of say, well, we would use this, sometimes we'll bring someone in here and be like, look at, look at our typical customer. Look at the problems they have. They're not like you. So just having that environment can be incredibly useful for building that habit. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about leadership a little bit and um, you know, the, the getting leaders involved, the role mm -hmm. they can play. Um, how, how should leaders and organizations promote new approaches to make sure that things stick? You know, for example, Eric Reese talks about working with GE and their FastWorks program mm -hmm. and talking to senior leadership. And you know, he said, you know, without Jeff Immelt's support from, uh, from the CEO, uh, role that that things wouldn't have moved along. So well, I'm curious here some of your stories or experiences. Does it always require the CEO or, or just to get enough leaders on board? Can, can you talk about that? Having a CEO backing something is incredibly useful. It's a I wouldn't quite say it's necessary, but you know it, it's definitely not sufficient. And I think that's been an interesting thing where we've had a lot of Yammer customers where the C-level executives are very pro Yammer and they're really baffled that and users and employees aren't using it. And I think the thing we found in lots of interviews is that the biggest predictor of people's behavior is what their direct manager is doing and wants. 
So it kind of makes sense. Think about a company like Microsoft. What are the odds that Satya Nadella is going to come fire me? Mm -hmm. Basically none. But if my boss doesn't like what I'm doing, he might. And so if Satya says, do this, and my boss is like, ah, I don't know about that, I'm going to go, you know, I know where my bread is butter. And that happens a lot of times where CEOs are like, yeah, Yammer is great, and middle managers are like, I think it's a waste of time, and then people don't end up using it. So CEOs can, can make people feel like something is really good. They can give it credibility, but it, it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, if they're not explaining how someone should change behavior because of it, that can also be insufficient. So someone says, use Yammer. If a CEO says, use Yammer, but never posts on Yammer, people are going to go by what he does, not by what he says. Mm -hmm. um, I would say a great example is to not only say some things, but to show your own commitment. So Scott Guthrie, who leads up the cloud and enterprise division at Microsoft, has been very big on getting his division to, to, do, to do lean, to be experimental. I came up and do, did some workshops, and he sat there through nine hours worth of workshops. And it was a very good statement to people. It was like, you should all come. I'm going to be there. And all of the product leaders saw that this guy, who's extremely busy, was there participating, showing that he thought it was important. I think that, you know, nine hours is a lot of time for an executive, but I think that investment is probably more useful than, than anything that he could have done. Any number of emails he could have said, but just sitting in the corner and listening and asking a couple of questions said, okay, wow, this guy thinks it's important. Our boss thinks it's important. We're going to do it. Yeah. So I think that, you know, having those well-placed time investments is huge. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple follow-up questions uh, from uh, uh, viewers, attendees here, about leadership. Um, so a different aspect of time. Uh, how can you encourage management to allow enough time for change to take hold in an organization, especially big companies that tend to be focused on quarterly metrics in, in the short term? Right. So uh, that, is a trick, that is a tricky thing, and I don't have it figured out entirely, I'll say. Yeah. One of the things can be just to focus on shorter-term things. So one of the things that's, you know, small successes and build from there is, is a thing that works a lot. And in most companies, product might not be the best place to start with change. Process is much faster. So if you want to get someone to A-B testing or building and they still have quarterly milestones and they're not used to this mindset, that's a big jump. But let's say something like meetings. So for example, the classic status meeting that happens in a lot of companies. Every week, everyone goes around and spends five minutes talking what they're working on. Well, if you've ever seen those, one person talks, everyone else is just answering email and not listening. So you've got this incredibly expensive meeting with all these high-paid people. No one is really listening to each other, which means that not only are you wasting time, but if I really needed to know what you were working on, I wouldn't actually know. And so we've said, you know, how could we make that more effective? Um, I often promote Yammer for this. Uh, it's something someone could do it on Slack as well or, you know, Wiki or any other format to say, look, have people post what they're working at in a place where other people can look it up later. And then you can skip that meeting. You can get your two hours back. And if I need to know what you're working on, I know to ask you and I know which questions to ask. And if not, it doesn't work. So we might try that. And I say, let's try it next week, and then we'll decide at the end of the week, was that good or bad? Should we keep doing it? So that's a very small experiment where you could try it, and someone might say, hey, that was great. That worked, that worked really well. I liked getting those two hours back. Let's keep doing it. Or it might, say, it might be like, you know what? Actually, we thought people were just updating statuses, but it really felt like it brought the team together and gave us a sense of morale, and we had our donuts. And, you know, it might not be the most effective thing, but we're not really willing to give it up. Okay. You know, you lost one week, now we learned something. Mm -hmm. And finding these very small opportunities for experimenting and succeeding or failing and then talking about why it was good. And then everyone's like, okay, we liked that experiment, we're willing to try another experiment. Mm -hmm. And just build from these tiny things is a good way to kind of get that buy-in. And after a while, people are used to experimenting, and so then they can feel more comfortable doing it on a product you know, process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like sort of an organizational build, measure, learn cycle of Absolutely. building, trying uh, some new practice, evaluate it, and then react accordingly. Right? Yeah. And I think as leaders, another thing that leaders can do is be very uh, clear and kind of over-communicate what's happening. Like, everyone, we're going to try this experiment. 
Jamie had this idea, we're going to try it out, and then at the end of the week we'll talk about whether it worked or not. Um, I think it's going to be a great idea, but we'll see, or something like that. And then at the end of the week, actually go back and say, as you remember, we were doing this experiment that, you know, one of my reports came up with. It was an interesting experiment. Here's what we learned from it. Actually, it didn't work so well, so we're not going to continue it. Or actually, it's great, and we are. And also to say, you know, to do the same thing with yourself. Like, I think we're going to do this. I can't count the number of times I've said, remember that process I wanted us to try? Okay, I admit it. It was a terrible idea. Like, I'm not going to make you keep doing it. You know, I was wrong. Let's move on. And I think that kind of humbling, like, hey, our leaders make mistakes and it's okay. I can make mistakes and it's okay. Mm -hmm. If you reinforce that, people remember that. Yeah, and that's in, like that. That's an important tone for for leaders uh, to you know, to lead by example, not mm -hmm. just voting with their feet of where they tend to go for meetings and showing that time commitment, like you said, but trying to lead and and show people different habits that can apply to their own customer development work. Mm -hmm. A um, couple other questions from folks on, on leadership. Um, talking about getting buy-in from senior leaders, middle managers. Uh, are, are there different approaches that, that work for people, uh, diff different roles, different levels of leadership like that? Sure. Well, I think there's a, different, a very different um, view in terms of how local to how global people are working on. So as a manager, I have a team. I want them to do well. I, want, I have certain goals for them. I have one-on-ones to do, I have coaching to do. It's fairly local. Someone above me has a little bit wider and wider and wider. So for me, something that helps my team do better is going to resonate very deeply. You say, hey, you can have better one-on-ones with someone by trying this new process. I'm going to try it. You go up a few levels, you know, an EVP at Microsoft is going to be like, look, you know, my one-on-ones are also with, with senior VPs. You know, these people have their own executive coaches. That's not my highest priority. My highest priority is, you know, how do we drive usage up or how do we get this contract signed or something higher level. So you look at the things that are most important to, to these folks. It might be driving a certain change. It might meet, be meeting certain numbers. And you think about how can they get the thing they want. And that's always, like, we're fundamentally selfish mm -hmm. creatures, humans are. We want the things we want. And you yeah. need to apply the correct level. And I'd say... One of the interesting things is in the early days of Yammer, we talked a lot about how Yammer benefits an organization as a whole. Turns out normal employees don't really care. I mean, people, it's not that people don't like their jobs. They actually want to do a good job, but on a very local level. People say, I want to do a good job at what I'm asked, and I don't want to let my teammates down. That's very different from saying, I'm interested in bringing Widget Co. into the next century. <laughs> they don't care. So don't even, you know, don't even use that. So, like, we've been experimenting with emails that say, you know, use Yammer, get your job done faster and smarter. Because that's what you care about. Your boss might care about different things, but that's what you care about. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more uh, on the theme here today of large enterprises? Mm -hmm. uh, with, within a large enterprise, trying to limit the number of stakeholders or, or team members, um, yet, you know, so not being uh, too, too small, but yet, um, you know, kind of how do you find the right balance of, the size of the group that you get input from to ensure buy-in but without getting bogged down, I think is the question. Sure. I think one of the things that's important is to kind of identify a risk profile with the folks above you. And, you know, I think in a customer service example, uh, supposedly, you know, the Ritz-Carlton gives all their employees a certain budget. Like, you can keep customers happy if you spend up to X amount. I think it's incredibly useful to have people kind of go to their boss and say, look, what's my risk profile? How much can I spend? Without, without you having to, to come in. And I, I think, you know, I told my employees, be reasonable. I think a lot of other corporations have, have stricter limits, but it might be, okay, you can try this experiment on this percentage of people, on this, you know, this number of emails. Uh, Twitter, supposedly, you can release experiments to 1% of the population. I think if you can get that, then, you know, in an ideal world, I don't actually want to be approving a lot of what my people do. It takes a lot of time. So I would much rather say, look, use your judgment. This is the level that you can go to without having to involve me at all. And the higher, if I can keep pushing that level up over time, the better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would go to an executive and say, we want to do this experiment. Here's the risk profile. Um, I don't see anything happening that we can't control. So we'd just like to basically tell you, when we get results. Hey, we did this thing, by the way, and here's what happened. And I think it's good to know what that level is and just be able to work within that and get people comfortable to that. It might be, it might be that you can only do experiments internally. 
that's not great, but it's a good starting point. If you can get your boss to say, look, you can try this crazy stuff on our team, but don't go beyond those walls, then try your crazy stuff on your team. And be very clear about, remember, here's my crazy experiments, here's what I learned, here's what I didn't learn, here's what I would recommend if I could try it on some extra people. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, kind of pushing that boundary very slowly works really well. And I have kids. Kids are the master at this, you know. Can I stay up for five more minutes? Can I stay up for ten <laughs> more minutes? What if I what if I read? Can then can I stay up longer? Um, but it works because you do end up giving more than you would have in the beginning. Yeah, and instead of the, the, the earlier you were talking about the what's in it for me, the kids never ask what's in it for mom to let me stay up five more minutes. Exactly, so. exactly. <laughs> um, we got some. Uh, let's talk maybe a little bit broader, lean startup. Um, methodology, we have a question that came in here about mm -hmm. um, strategies for evangelizing lean methods within a team that's very, um, you know, IT traditional focus of a roadmap of features that come mm -hmm. top down as opposed to being focused on learning and discovery. Um, how can you convince management to give lean a try? One of the things that can work is to get people to tell you what their current risks and costs are. And this is, this is tricky because it's hard to just go in and say, look, Mark, you're doing things wrong. You know, you did this and it cost you this much money. You're, you're going to get defensive and you're not going to respond to that. But if I start asking you, like, tell me about the last time you rolled out that project. Well, how long did it take to support things? How, you know, how much customer support cost was there? Oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, how much follow-up did you have to do with customers to make sure that that feature worked? Oh, yeah, that sounds like a lot. Um, you know, how did that amount of time compare to the time you put into building that feature? And kind of get someone to realize, whoa, the thing we're doing right now is already costing us. Because we don't perceive a cost that is already present to us. And, uh, you know, I'll give an example. Or another Microsoft team was uh, embedded in Yammer a couple weeks ago, and they were talking to customers, and one of them said, I was shocked to find out how ready people were to call customer support. She's like, that's like a $300 an hour cost. And to our customers, it's just, it's like the first thing they do. And so that was a very good learning that, you know, she was able to pull out. I didn't have to tell her, not that I knew, but, but realizing that and saying, wow, the thing we're doing right now, the thing that we think works, is already costing us this amount. You know, if we release a feature, you know, within Microsoft, if we release a feature and it goes out to our customers, there's a certain number of time that we're legally bound to support that feature. Which means, and many other customers, many other companies have the same thing. Which means, if we release a feature that's not a very good feature, we're stuck supporting that for years. That's a massive cost. So when you think about things like, someone will say, "Well, what if we release this on iOS first and not the other platforms? That will seem unfair. That seems like a bad idea. Like people are going to criticize us." And like, but what if we release it on iOS and no one uses it? Mm -hmm then we save the cost of having released it on four other platforms and we save the cost of having to support it for a year, two years, and that's um, immense. Yeah. And so you kind of ask the questions to get to what are the costs we're facing today. And a lot of times we find that we have a certain amount of predictability and a certain amount of schedule that we can control, but these just immense costs because we can't, you yeah. know, we've got these things out here that are wrong. Yeah. Well, it's some, there's different approaches for somebody who has a feature or a product. They're excited. They think it's great. They want to, let, uh, you know, they, they say, well, we should let it impact as many lives as possible, mm -hmm. as opposed to stepping back and saying, what's the smallest change right. that we could test and experiment with, just in case it doesn't mm -hmm. work out. That, that's a very different mindset, and we, I, I see people struggle with that sometimes in in, uh, in healthcare and other settings. Mm -hmm getting past the habit of doing a big splash instead of doing a small test right. and, and, and moving on from there. And I think in some ways that's getting easier because there are so many bad examples out there. There, there are you know, giant launches that were ridiculous. And then you can kind of point to and say, yeah, Color, they did a big marketing app. And no, one's, no one even remembers that as a product. So pointing out that like big launches have a problem. Also sharing just the sheer numbers from other companies. So... Every company who talks publicly about A-B testing, uh, you know, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, will tell you that at least half of their experiments fail. They don't move the metrics they are intended to move. And to keep reminding people, like, yes, you are very smart, I am very smart, so are all these other customers and companies. Nonetheless, there's a very good chance that this feature, which seems brilliant and perfect, 
is actually very, very wrong. Mm -hmm. There's so many examples out there, you know, there's no way that we're that much smarter than all these other companies. Yeah. So yeah. we test it so we can make sure. So um, talking about you know, other companies and the idea of getting buy-in, there was another question that came in here about how important is it to have other organizations you can point to or case studies to reference as examples when talking to the management about change or new approaches like customer development and lean startup. How, how do you utilize those or when? Case studies are incredibly important because everyone is afraid that they will screw up. And so being able to point to, look, these people did it and they didn't screw up can be helpful. Um, I will say, though, that case studies have to be employed with caution, which is that you need to have appropriate, relevant case studies. So a, a financial institution does not want to hear about what Facebook is doing. You know, Bank of America is not going to say, oh, Facebook did it, that's great for us. That's a different risk profile. It's so different that that might actually have the, the inverse effect and say, mm -hmm. like, well, we don't even want to do the things that Facebook is doing. And I used to work for a company that built financial applications, and, and they were very resistant to case studies that were not from companies like them. And mm -hmm. so you had to even, even within banks, um, you know, conservative banks didn't want case studies from more free-floating banks. You know, Northern Trust didn't want to hear what ING was doing because they're like, you know, they're on the internet, they're crazy. Um, so case studies can be useful. They need to be people who seem similarly uh, large and high risk. Internal case studies are great. In the beginning, sometimes you don't have them, and, and that's when starting small and getting those small wins and building up gradually can be really useful. I know there is, uh, in my book, I quote a program that came up within Aetna. And Aetna Healthcare... There weren't a lot of case studies when they started. There weren't other healthcare companies they could point to. And so they had to have a very small internal, we're going to try this thing, and then we're going to try something slightly larger, and then slightly larger, and then it took off. But, you know, the people inside there would say, no one here cared what software companies were doing. No one even cared what other enterprises were doing. It had to be healthcare or nothing. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's funny, there's, there's maybe a balance to be found where people sometimes want case examples that are too closely mirrored to their organiz own mm -hmm. organization. I see this on, you know, online lean forums, a manufacturing company will say, we're looking for uh, an ice cream manufacturer in Vermont that right. is, has a left-handed CEO and, you know, with the, yeah. you know they, they want basically to look in the mirror or, mm -hmm. you know, so there's probably a risk of looking for too close of a parallel and not looking for inspiration that might come from surprising yeah. places, right? Yeah. And I think, I think again, with that cultural, culture and size and risk, you can kind of say, okay, you know, ice cream manufacturer, there's not another Vermont ice cream manufacturer just like you that I can point to, but there's an artisanal food provider in Sonoma who seems to have similar values and a similar, you know, market cap as you, and here's a case study from that. Or even, you know, here's a, here's a yoga shop who seems to have a similar uh, market profile as you, and I think they're fa facing the same risks, and here's a case study. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, a question, kind of jumping back into some details here about the customer development process. This might be more of a loaded question than a leading question, but it asks, <laughs> I'm going to ask it okay. anyway. I think it's okay. Um, how do we follow the customer development process and keep delivery deadlines in sight. At some point, we need to produce something. Right. Well, you know, it's not, it's it's a little loaded, but, but that's true. Like, at some point, you need to build something, right? So one of the things is, if you can, help celebrate learnings, not just shipping. So I know you do have to ship something, absolutely. But sometimes you're going to say, look, it's been a month, what have we learned? Another time, it's, it can be useful to say, we're going to do this much research for this amount of time, and then at some point your gut has to take over. I mean, product intuition, product vision, you can't customer develop your way all the way into a product. It just doesn't happen. I, I might talk to 50 customers. I might get a list of, I might have a, a good insight into how they behave and their constraints and what they want and the problems they're trying to solve. At the end of the day, as a product person, I need to prioritize what's the most important and what's the most in line with my product vision, and my business model. And so there's always that filter that goes on. So it might be, you know, we're going to talk to customers for a month, and then based on that, we're going to make our best guess. And you're always effectively making your best guess. Okay, thanks. Um, there's another question that came in um, about 
how, how can you apply lean to building internal tools, things that aren't out external customer facing, but things for internal workflow? Do you have any stories or examples there? Sure, and I think our customers are our customers, whether they're internal or external. And I think a lot of times we feel that people paying us money is, is what a customer is. But you know, within a company, internal tools, if, they're, if internal tools are bad, for example, they're costing you a ton of money. If they're good, they're saving you a ton of money. So you can do the same thing, which is to interview people and figure out how are they working today? What is frustrating them today? What's causing them extra work today? And for example, we do a lot of postmortems after our project initiatives, even after our hack days, where we'll go around and talk to people and say, what was your experience like? What, what went well and didn't go well? How can we be better? Basically like one-on-one -on -one postmortems. You know, to kind of get at, well, I'm doing my job okay, but here's what's frustrating me. Or every time I have to do this particular thing, you know, there's a risk that this thing goes wrong and then I have to back all out all my changes. Um, you, you learn those things. You learn the behaviors people have and the needs they have, and you can prioritize those as well. So I would say the main thing that people have to get over is this kind of sense of, I'm going to feel stupid interviewing my coworker. Because you do to some degree. You're like, hi, Bob, that I sit next to every single day. Tell me about how you do your job. And it feels weird and artificial, but if you can actually get them talking, then that's, that's great. You're going to learn it, and you're going to be able to develop a tool and say, look, I know how Bob works. I know he needs something that he can he can use on his laptop because that's what he carries around all the time. Or like, I know how Kelly works, and I know that she you know does most of her work in the morning and, and at these times, and and she gets you know a ton of work coming in at this time. So we need to elaborate for that. Okay, and uh, there's another question here about developing internal tools. Do you have any suggestions for statistically helpful A/B testing when you have a small audience, if you only have a couple of people in each role and a handful of roles within an organization? So I would say that A-B testing is not useful if you have a small set of people, whether it's internal or external. It's just you're not going to achieve any kind of significance. If you have few enough people that you're worried about significance, you should be doing interviews or you should be watching them use the tool and seeing what they're doing and asking, wait, why are you doing that? oh, well, how would you do it if you did this other way? Or if you had this, if we could see more results, would that make it faster? You know, show me how you might try this other thing. All qualitative. So you know, in the beginning stages, you're going to learn the most from that. And it's true, it's not the same as watching people on their own. And people always behave a little bit differently when they're being But there's not much you can do about that. And A-B test with six people doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, so let's, before we wrap up, um, let's we'll step back and look maybe at you know, some higher level questions. So let's say we're in a scenario where Lean has been introduced, you've gotten people on board, they're doing experiments, things are running well. Um, when, once somebody, an organization has these methods running successfully, does it help to maintain any sort of you know, quote unquote Lean department or um, you know, uh, organization that is really kind of focused on the methodology to help scale or, uh, you know, Related to that, does that, an organization like that, if it's helpful, need to be around forever? Sure. So, you know, interestingly, I, I'm totally against separate departments, innovation departments. I feel like, though, that's a contradiction in terms. If you have a separate set of people whose job is just to do a thing, then uh, if you have a, a, a distinct set of people whose job is, you know, lean whatever, that's not going to be long-term effective. Everyone needs to feel like that's part of their job. Now, that said, cheerleaders are incredibly effective. But the interesting thing is a lot of people who are in enterprises will know this. The consultant effect. A third-party consultant comes in to fix something, gives you a bunch of recommendations. Does anyone want to listen to that person? No. Because they don't have a lot of credibility. Like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, that woman can come in here and tell us all the things we can do. She doesn't know what our real workplace is like. So just being that person who is the coach loses you a lot of credibility because people say, well, you don't, you don't have another real job. So I've found, you know, for example, when I've gone to Microsoft, a lot of teams have told me, you know, oh, we, you know, we've heard stuff like this before, but this is the first time we've heard it from someone who actually works here, so now we're going to take it seriously, which kind of makes me laugh, but it, it's true. I think I have a lot of credibility because I still do this stuff full time. And so if you have Lean embedded, I think there's absolutely a lot of benefit in having lean champions and maybe even providing some training and letting those people like have lunches together and that sort of thing. 
but the Department of Lean allows everyone else to say, it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. if, as long as there's a Department of Lean, then that's not my job, it's their job. And I think that's incredibly risky. And I think when companies try and kickstart innovation programs, they think, we'll have one team, they're really dedicated, we can pour resources into them, yeah. but you just end up, it's a consultant problem. Yeah, and, and, and people have been promoting that same idea of manufacturing for 30 years or more. You can't mm -hmm. rely on a quality department to deliver quality. Right. It has to be uh, embedded throughout. Um, a couple kind of quick hitter questions here that were topics in the uh, Eventbrite sign-up page, and I don't know if we quite touched on. Uh, what are some things not to say when you're pushing for change? Um, sure. One, uh, so within lean terminology specifically, minimum viable product was a terrible phrase within Microsoft. Everyone hated it. People responded very negatively to their minds. It was crappy, no quality product. And you know, you couldn't say, no, 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 that's not really what it means. Like, there, that's a waste of breath. And so we stopped with that very quickly. So I talk a lot of times about hypothesis-driven development. I talk about being experimentally focused. I talk about validating hypotheses. Minimum viable product is, is no good. Fail fast, same thing. And, and there have been a lot of people kind of arguing against that. Fail fast sounds like give up on shit right away. And that's not what it means. It means, it means if, you know, be experimental. If it's not working, be willing to change course. But there are a lot of folks who interpret that badly. So it's just not worth pushing some of these terms that are a little edgier, that play well in startups and don't play well in the enterprise. Um, another thing is just to kind of going in and being like, you're doing it wrong. And like I said, when we were first acquired, I feel like we had a little bit of you're doing it wrong. It's very much, tell me about what you're doing today. Oh, tell me what's working particularly well and not well. And letting people you know, articulate that on their own. It's like in the same way, you know, if you had a friend who had a terrible boyfriend, you wouldn't be like, your boyfriend's a jerk. You would, try, you would maybe help them try and come to that realization themselves. <laughs> but you never want to put people on the defensive because it just it doesn't work. People don't learn when they're on the defensive. It's like our brains shut down. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, again, a psychology background coming into play. These are important <laughs> lessons, right? Right. Um, are there some good ways to settle product debates uh, without the uh, the quote unquote hippo dominating the highest paid person's right. opinion. I think one of the things so there's two things that can, that can happen here. One is that everyone is going about their business, they're specking out a product, they're all they're all excited, and then and then the hippo comes in and is like, oh, here's what I think, and, and the swoop and poop, I believe, is the mm -hmm. is the metaphor there. So that's one problem. Yeah. The other problem is the I think we should do this. You think we should do that. We're peers. Let's try and get our boss to settle the argument. So those are two different problems. I'll talk about each of them. For the swoop and poop phenomenon, I think one of the things to do, first of all, is to uh, tell people that they're doing that. Uh, so and I find myself doing it as well. My team will come up with a solution. And they'll be like, I think you should do this. And they'll be like, wait a second. I'm sorry. Don't, don't listen to me. <laughs> like, I'm doing that thing, and I don't want to. Yeah. And if one of them says, uh, Cindy, you know, we've been thinking about this for a while, uh, and I'll be, oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing nothing. So if you have a boss who kind of comes in and says, I think you should do this other thing, sometimes just very neutrally saying, you know, we've been thinking about this for a long time. I think we've got a really good background. Um, let's, let's explain why we've made these suggestions. Another one can just be to frame the feedback you're asking for. So let's say I come with a proposal to my boss, and, I'm sa and I say, you know, Here's my deck. The boss is going to give whatever feedback pops into their mind. What's more useful is to frame very clearly, here is the problem I was trying to solve. Here are the, you know, the things that I took into consideration. Here's why I suggest this solution. You know, do you see any risks inherent to this, or, or are there things that I've missed? And very focused feedback. So not, what do you think? That's a terrible question to ask. That's inviting hipponess. But to say, you know, here's this specific thing, I have a reason for it, do you think that that meets our goals? And when someone says, why are you doing this? To reiterate, here's the problem we're trying to solve, here's, this, here's why we thought this was a great solution. Do you agree with the problem that we identify? Yes? Okay, well then let's talk about why this solution doesn't meet the problem. So just having these kind of conversational templates to fall back upon. Mm -hmm. In the other case, where you have two peers, and I think one thing, and you think another, and so let's get our boss to settle it, 
Um, as a manager, I basically refuse to settle those. Um, so if, if my team were to come to me and say, you know, I think we should do this and she thinks we should do this, what do you think? I, w I, would, I would say I'm not going to pick sides here. You guys need to figure out a way to get some data. It might be talking to customers. It might be running a quick survey. It might be figuring out how you can do an A-B test. It might be there's a bunch of tools online for doing quick click tests or quick kind of five-second tests. Just give me some data, and then maybe I can make a call for you, but I'd really rather you come to an update that, that the two of you can agree on something. So just kind of pushing down that I'm not going to be the bet settler has been really effective. So, you know, occasionally I still get it, but most of the time, like, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. And I'm still, I'm still fixated on the idea of a hippo swooping. <laughs> I don't think Be very are. ungraceful. I, I, the, the, the phrase I've heard is seagull management because you know yeah. what seagulls do. They fly yeah. in and they yeah. They poop. Yeah. Um, so um, to wrap up, um, I try to end on a more graceful <laughs> topic than that. Um, do you have a couple of key takeaways that people watching could maybe go put into practice immediately? Anything else that you'd like to suggest? Sure. So one thing that you can do right now is think about your day-to-day -day and think about the things that you grumble about or that your team grumbles about but no one has done anything about. And a lot of times this is meetings. Like So most people watching probably have at least one meeting that's not a good meeting. Think about how could you make that meeting better and propose an experiment. So next week, instead of having that status meeting, let's post status updates on Yammer. Or next week, instead of having that meeting that always runs long, let's appoint someone a moderator. Or let's try giving everyone a one-minute limit on how long they can talk. Or let's have people raise hands. And even silly things like that. So take a meeting, think of a way to make it better, try it. At the end of the week, you know, discuss, was that good or bad? Should we keep this practice or not? So you, had an ex you put an experiment into place. So you can start that right now. Mm -hmm. Another one is get a post-it or something and write down what is the problem. You know, focus mm -hmm. on the problem first. So you have a physical reminder that you should step back and focus on that problem. That's another really great thing. Um, another one is next time someone complains, ask them what they could do about it mm -hmm. or ask them why, why they want this differently. So those are things I guarantee you within the next 24 to 48 hours someone is going to say, we just need to do this or we just need to build this and you can ask, why should we do that? What's the problem we're trying to solve? And you might get some really interesting piece of insight out of that that you could actually move forward with. Yeah. Well, great. Well, um, Cindy, thank you for sharing you know, stories and experiences and thoughts and helping preview um, the conference. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and hand things back over to Jeanette to wrap up. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. This wraps up our show. Please join us again for the next webcast on September 10th. In the meantime, visit leanstartup.co for more information on the Lean Startup Conference, November 16th through 19th in San Francisco. Thanks so much, everybody.